Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence. How you doing? I hope that you're doing great. Uh, mahalo for tuning in. Today we've got a very special guest joining us. He is one of the talented, charismatic sons of reggae and cultural superstar Bob Marley. And we're fortunate to have four island dates ahead. July 2nd in Kona, July 3rd in Kapa'a on Kauai, July 4th in Honolulu, and July 5th on Maui and Kihei. Tickets are on sale now. He's known for being humble, soft-spoken, sincere, and loyal. His name is East African and means adventurous traveler. He's recently worked in the famous Tough Gong Studios his father founded in Kingston, Jamaica, and has also been featured in a number of films and television shows. He even opened for VH on the 2007 reunion with David Lee Roth. It's a great pleasure to welcome on the line my very special guest, Kimani Marley. Aloha and mahalo, my brother. Maximum respect. Yes, my brother. Thank you for having me on the program. And, you know, I must say I'm always looking forward to being in Hawaii. Let me just say that to begin with. What's your personal history and experience with the islands? For 97 to like 2002, I was back and forth through Hawaii a lot. I really love the energy. I love the vibe of the people. I love the atmosphere. I just love, you know what I mean? I love everything about it. I, I, I look forward to being in Hawaii. When you think of Hawaii, what are memories that come to mind immediately? Like when you're saying how special it is in your mind, what are you looking at? How much I to surf comes to mind. Um, <laughs> a very good friend of mine, Fiji, that lives over in Hawaii, comes to mind. And the atmosphere, the people, the energy, the vegetation. <laughs> are you a surfer or was it just a one-time thing? I'm not a surfer. It was actually not a one-time thing, but, you know, it, it was definitely where I started my first surfing lessons. But, you know, it's something that I enjoy. I'm not saying I'm good at it. I'm still <laughs> working on it. So hopefully when I get back out, you know, I'll be able to pick up a few more lessons and a few more tips. That's very cool, man. When you think of Hawaii, and you obviously you've got friends here, you've got connections, you've been appreciated in the community, and you obviously know that reggae has a very, very powerful place in our local community. And I'm curious, aside from Jamaica, have you visited a lot of islands and ever noticed this unusual connection that all islands have sort of to reggae? Definitely. There's definitely a connection there. And it's a beautiful thing, too, you know, to see people who are so far embrace it and not only embrace it, but embrace it and, and took it and recreated it, just put their touches on it and kind of made it their own. And I find that with a lot of Hawaiian artists, and I love that about it. It's really evolving into more than what I would say the traditional reggae is. But, you know, you still have these with that hardcore, that one drop, but with just the coloring of the Hawaiian vibe and the Hawaiian people. So, you know, I really dig that. I really dig that. So in a lot of ways, too, Kimani. It's sort of a tribute, I guess, to your father, the huge impact that he had and then what you're describing, the way all these local people out here sort of picked up the mantle and have made their, their own Jawaiian and... Their own imprint on it, right. Right. Is there anything you can think of that makes reggae connect with people? You know what? I think it is. I think reggae, the traditional reggae, the reggae that has the message of peace, love, and unity amongst all and not separate, not getting crossed and mixed with religion and everything else. But I think when you find that authentic sound, that music speaks to the soul. It reaches far beyond than what you're just hearing. This is a music that, you know, I say it's one of the only music that speaks to the heart, mind, body, and soul. You know what I mean? It's a vibration that speaks to you. Not only are you receiving the message in your head, but you're receiving it deeper than that. It's just a music that moves you internally. It's an unusual groove. Unu and it's so simple. It is. A bunch of arrangements or a bunch of this or a bunch of solos. It's just straightforward, rootsy, organic music. You know what I mean? Not too much additives. Yet it can have such different flavors. Yet it still has so many different flavors. Right. I love to see the barriers that this reggae music break down, you know what I mean? All in the name of, of righteousness. Like, I love it. I know there's a lot of artists that, a lot of people in general that hate. You know what I mean? But, you know, I've been a student and a fan of music in general. So for me, good music is good music, no matter where it's coming from. Oh, totally, brother. And it's good to see it break down barriers. Definitely break down barriers. Let me ask you a few things about the sense of responsibility, Kimani. Do you feel any kind of responsibility or maybe even obligation of some kind to protect or even further your father's legacy? I do. 
I feel a responsibility coming from such a great legacy and from first I had an experience I know means so much to the people out there of what my father speak about and who he was as a person. For me, it becomes a responsibility because taking on this music, I know like when I first came out, people just started getting used to Kimani. There was a lot of critique and saying I'm singing gangster rap and you know, all this other stuff, which to me, I've never sang gangster rap music, you know what I mean? Because I've never said I, I'm doing this or I'm shooting up anybody or I'm selling anything. You know, my music has always been from my point of view. So coming back to that, you know, for me, it was always to stay true and carrying on my father's legacy. You know, it was always for me also to stay true to myself and relay my message the way I know how while keeping it positive while looking for that brighter future. So I did from early years, once I got into this music thing, that knowing that if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna have a responsibility because I cannot come now and contradict the path that my father has laid as far as his legacy and what he's about. His message. I knew that it was my responsibility to make sure that I uphold you know, this legacy and make sure that I do it in a positive way, but do it in my way at the same time. It's a powerful thing, and I imagine there are moments where you're having a lot of fun and you're very easygoing and happy and proud of who you are, but I can imagine that it can be somewhat stressful in what you were talking about, because it is. It's some weight on your shoulders. It is some weight. It is some weight, and then, you know, in the midst of it, keeping up the legacy, there's also the weight of trying to become successful while doing it all. That's right. You know what I mean? Totally. There is a weight there, definitely. When was uh, the last time that you were in Jamaica? And talk about the changes that you've witnessed, if you can, from some of your earliest memories there up to today. Uh, last time I was in Jamaica I was about two weeks ago, two to three weeks ago. The changes for me from when I was living there, because I left Jamaica when I was seven years old, and maybe I returned twice within 17 years after that. But um, the changes that I see is that we're no longer just this free, caring, loving society. I remember growing up for me, like, I was really free to move about my neighborhood, the town, Mm. as I wanted to. The crime rate was there, but it wasn't like what it is now, to the extent of the violence, too. So we find that Jamaica has become, or trying to be, a little America. And I remember when the older folks used to say to me that, cable TV is ruining the country and I couldn't understand what they were saying like <laughs> cable TV ruined the country but growing up now and just seeing what this younger generation is exposed to at such an early age that we weren't exposed to we find that they start to develop fast and get into other things fast and you know a lot of time it's not positive things so we find that the country is really it's a different place now like for me the way I used to roam about, I wouldn't bring my children down there and tell them to go roam about freely like, you know, I used to do it. Wow. It's a different place. But yet it's still that place that has that vibration. It's just still this this little rock, this little beautiful island that has such a positive, such a high energy, such, you know, I say it all the time, it's the only place that I go to where I feel one with the earth. Like the minute I put my foot down, I feel like, okay, I'm connected to this place is like I'm plugged up, I'm being recharged now. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's still home. Where were you last time you were there? I was in Kingston. Is that where you go most when you're there? That's where I am most. I visit the countryside where I'm from. I'm from a little town called Falmouth. Yeah, I know. I know where you're from. We get back to my town. There's a school there that, you know, I've been trying to help out work on to refurbish, getting them in. Um, computer desk, um, textbooks, um, book bags for the children. That's a school you went to? Yes, yeah, school I went to as a child. So I'm also trying to give back to the community where I come from. But I spent a lot of time in Kingston at my father's house at 56 Hope Road. So, you know, majority of the time, if I'm in Jamaica, uh, you will find me there. So if you're there, just swim through. Is that a... um, If I'm in the town, I would be right there. Are you uh, that, that sweet of you, my brother? I, I was fortunate last year. I got to spend a little bit of time with one of your brothers, Ziggy. And he was really, really nice to me. And he came to my studio. We spent like an hour. He played acoustic. I mean, it was, um, it was a very, very special 
uh, moment. I'm just curious, how close are you with your fellow Marley siblings, and who are you closest to? Oh, wow. I'm, I'm close to all my brothers, you know. I'm close to all my brothers and sisters. Um, I give credit to my older brother, Stephen Marley, for really keeping us close. But, you know, of course, me, I sometimes, just like any family, we have discrepancies and we have little arguments, but for the most part, we're very close. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. It's okay. And we've been that way um, since I can remember. Actually, the start of my career, and even now, a lot of my music and, and a lot of what I do, really, even my last album is really is coming from Stephen Groom and, and training and molding and, you know what I mean, helping me out to approach the different genres that I do tend to approach. So the family unit is great. Stop it, stop it. So Stephen is the one that you're closest to, I'm hearing. Um, I wouldn't say I'm close. Wow, closest to, okay. If I had to pick one to say I'm closest to, that would be Rohan. Okay. Right, um, and that would be because... Me and Rowan lived in Miami, so my early years when I just moved to Miami, it was me and him. I, I, I would only see Steven and Ziggy like summer vacation for a couple of months out of the year. Do you see Ziggy these days? When I'm in California. Okay, that's cool. Hey, stop it. What kind of dog is that? <laughs> Actually, it's my daughter's two dogs. It's a little Yorkie. <laughs> <laughs> we have ducks outside, so they keep to the window to bark at the ducks. Sometimes I let them out, let them chase the ducks. <laughs> what state are you in? <laughs> I'm in Florida. I'm in Miami. <laughs> um, hey, um, before I uh, wrap it up, I have one other topic I sort of got to hear about. I love my rock music, and I love my VH. I saw Van Halen with Sammy, but I was never fortunate to get to see them with Dave. I've seen Dave solo, but you actually got to be an opening act on a very important rock reunion tour of 2007, and I'd like you to tell me how you got on the Van Halen reunion with David Lee Roth tour. You know what? I got on, um, it was through my management at that time. It's funny because they was going out on tour, and they, they were looking for an opening act and I think my management I had just finished my album but the crazy thing was my album was more of a hip hop album so when they told me about it my first instinct was like nah definitely not because I can't promote this album in that crowd but then at the same time I had music that I've always recorded you know my that this is like my heart felt heart and soul which is like where reggae kind of meets rock but you know it's kind of a rock reggae feel like your dad's classic music. Like, okay, I'm going to take it. I'm going to play music now that nobody has ever heard before and see what happens. And I remember before the tour, true story, I remember before the tour, I started checking on some of the blogs. And, you know, a lot of the bloggers was like, well, why is it, you know, they have this reggae artist going out with rock. Nobody want to hear that. And just a lot of negative things, right? <laughs> it almost started to make me nervous. And I was like, okay. Um, so I remember the first night, we went out the first night and I got on stage and people were sitting in the front while the people that was there had their arms folded and the people having conversations and you know, all the things that goes on. And I just remember going through my set and you know, after the first song got into the second song, I noticed that the arms that were folded are no longer folded anymore. And the people who had their back turned to me is now looking at me. And I left that first show to a standing ovation. And you know, that ride was great for the five months that I was out there. I came to learn that David and my father had a a very unique relationship. You know, they were somewhat friends or cross paths a few times. So, you know, him not knowing me or my music at the time when they told him about it, he was like, yeah, blind, basically blindfolded. He gave me that opportunity. And, you know, I really thank him for that. And, you know, I think I accomplished what I set out to accomplish. One of the things I wanted to accomplish was to know that no matter what stage you put me on in front of, any audience that I will have something that you'll be able to enjoy, listen to, or relate to, lyrically and 
musically. You know, so it was great. Um, I was in my dressing room. I was in the back of my bus, and you know, the first time meeting David, actually, um, he sent his bodyguard came in to my bus, and he had a a toy plane, a model plane, and he said, you know, um, David said to give you this gift. So I'm looking at it, and it's a, it's a model plane. So I'm like, a model plane? I'm like, okay, well, why would David think to send me a model plane <laughs> as a gift? Like, okay, why not as a T-shirt when I open the box? And under the wings, it was a fighter jet. So under the wings where the, 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 the missiles were, under the wings, he had actually rolled a few spliffs. <laughs> They the one did wings immediately for me and um, they delivered it to me. <laughs> yeah, I had a blast out of that one. And, you know, we, 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 we tried a few times. He made sure I was okay on the road. He made sure that I was being treated properly. And, you know what I mean? The people that was working for him was make sure that at, at, at all times they were courteous to us and made sure that we got what we needed. What you're saying to me, if I can paraphrase, is through this experience, you realize that David Lee Roth has a deep appreciation for your father's music, and when he saw that he had a chance to take you out on the road and do right by your pop's legacy, he jumped on it. Right. right. He's a great guy. And I hear, you know, I had stories that there's not many opening acts that last that long with him. You know, usually they're there for a month or less, and then they go. And I was actually there for five months. Well, I can tell you, the only time I ever met him... Five months. When I met him, he was a very, very nice guy. I know he loves great music because when I met him a long time ago, he was in our radio studio in Boston and he was telling all these stories about listening to James Brown and all this funk and stuff when he was a kid. And so I think what you told me makes me like him even more, that he, he was showing your pop some respect, if you can think of it like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And every night he would get on stage, he would, you know, tell a fan, give it up for the opening. But he would always give us a shout out too, which, of course, he doesn't have to do. And there's no reason for him to do it, <laughs> you know, other than genuinely, you know what I mean, being driven to doing it. Right. Yeah. That's a great story. That's a great one to wrap it up on. I leave you with this thought, Kimani. When you're here, I know you're doing four islands in four days. It's a real quick thing. But I'm in Honolulu. You'll be here July 4th. I would love to have you come by our radio station if there's at any chance during the middle of the day, like right around 2 o'clock. Uh, definitely, definitely, definitely. So I would definitely come through to the studio. Cool. So should I just reach out to Eric? Is he my guy? That's your guy. And we'll set it up, and I'll give you a big hug and a high five. And I hope that you've enjoyed talking today. I really have. Oh, uh, man, I, 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 you know, one of the better interviews I've had. Really? Some of them are really... <laughs> that means a lot. Well, you're the man. I give you a big hug. I'll reach out to Eric. Have a great rest of your day, and thank you again. Respect. Aloha, brother.